This is Joel Kotkin. And this is Marshall Toplansky. And you're listening to the Feudal Future Podcast. Our society is being rapidly reduced to a feudal state, a process now being exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Millions of small businesses are near extinction. Millions more are losing their jobs, and many others will be stuck in the status of propertyless serfs. The big winners have been the expert class of the clerisy, and most of all, the tech oligarchs, who benefit as people rely more on algorithms than human relationships. With this, around the world, the middle class is becoming more squeezed than ever. And it's having profound economic, social, and spiritual implications. Here on the show, we're having conversations with business, government, and citizen leaders like you to get to the core of these issues and explore how we can work together to form a better future than the one we're headed towards. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. I'm Joel Kotkin. And we are delighted today to focus on Africa and its future. And uh, given the the world of um, the world of the middle class, uh, does Africa have the opportunity of creating a viable middle class lifestyle for the people who are living there? So today we are delighted to invite two guests to join us. Uh, first is Beheki Malobo who is with the Center for Risk Analysis at the Institute of Race Relations in uh, South Africa. That is South Africa's oldest think tank. And joining him is Hugo Kruger, who is a structural engineer who's worked on many, many projects throughout Africa and has a great perspective on how Africa's economy is progressing. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us, Marshall and Joel. Um, Anyway, this is a a great pleasure and and learning experience for us. Um, One of the things I I think is really critical on a global level is that um, according to um, when um, Hugo has has mentioned that about 40% of the world's population by 2050 will be living in Africa. And so it seems to me that the fate of Africa is really the fate of the world. And how do you think Africa can sort of get back on track or is it going to remain kind of a laggard um you know if it's 40 percent of the world's population that's a big problem yeah um i suppose that just to to picture that by the end of the century according to un projections that's that's where i get the data from uh, the population of africa will be as big as the population of asia at the moment so we already see how what a challenge it has been for asia to bring them people into the middle class we, we can see in India, for example, it's not done yet. There's still a lot of work to be done in India. China has been progressing much more rapidly in the last 30 years. And this is where Africa is now, right? Africa is now at the point of urbanization that China and India was 30 years ago. And I think that's underappreciated by Western countries. So in terms of Africa, Becky is uh, more of a data-driven person, so he's, he can back more substantial what I'm trying to say now. But Africa itself is a mixed story. Um, it depends which country we're talking about, obviously. There's an enormous amount of success happening in Rwanda, um, East Africa, particularly Ethiopia, I think it's got some right ideas. Unfortunately, some of the right ideas is often coupled with authoritarianism. But, the, um, you know, it's the Singapore model. You can, f- you can discipline people into development. South Africa is far more democratic, I would say. Um, so is Botswana. Um, you've got other places like the DRC, which um, I find just depressing to look at. I looked at this statistic the other day. They've got 9% of the population have got electricity, right? Um, that is a, a more depressing country. So when we that, talk about that's Africa... That's the Democratic Republic of the Congo, right? That's just right. So former, former Zaire. Um, so when we talk about Africa, you need to be specific what country you're talking about. So Becky and I are generally from South Africa. And then also when South Africans go to Africa, we say we're going to Africa, right? We're going to, so we, we're, kind of, we're kind of like the United States of, of Africa in a way. You know, we see ourselves as different as the race, which is probably not the best way to look at it. Um, but um, South Africa itself has got different challenges than say Zimbabwe has got, than say the DRC has got, that Uganda or whoever has got. I need to be specific. Um, say the big challenge for Africa has been, will be how do we bring these people that are urbanizing or have urbanized at the rapid rate into the middle class? Yeah. Heki, what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so the from a South African lens, really what Hugo touched on, the most challenging part of essentially increasing uh, the population, especially in urban zones, is it's rather making the environment for employment right. Uh, the, the current problem that South Africa is facing right now is the thinking of the ruling government, the ANC, which is quite different from the early administration of, of the ANC during the early years of democracy in South Africa. Uh, during the early years of South Africa, we had uh, a large amounts of growth. We had average around GDP growth rates of three to five percent. Uh, and right now, that's just a dream. We have GDP growth rates of about one percent, even lower currently. And in the early years of South Africa, the ruling government followed policies that enabled uh, economic performance, that enabled uh, rising living standards for the general South Africans, and essentially allowed an increase in the middle class of people. Uh, unfortunately, that's something that is uh, currently stagnated due to the change in the thinking of the ANC. You know, the the when, when you were talking about the Singapore model a, a moment ago, Hugo, and 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 how China has done really an, an amazing job of pulling people out of grinding poverty. Um, there is a certain degree of authoritarian. Uh, that was accompanied with those with that development, but there were also um, uh, to much less ethnically and I think in in Africa's case tribally diverse populations. Um, it was much more of a homogeneous group, and um, uh, to what degree do you think Africa's diversity is going to work for it or against it when it comes to development? Now that's that's an excellent question. Um, look, I, I wouldn't say Asia is necessarily homogeneous. It's what we would call homolithic. In other words, it's cultures that are very close to each other, even though they've got their own subdiversity. Now, in Africa, you've got that as well in, in some places. To give you an idea, South Africa, for example, we've got 11 official languages, but you can sort of group these languages into two, maybe three main groups. You know, your Zulu, Zulu Kosa languages tend to fall in one, one linguistic group. And you've got the Sututswana group fall into one of one group. But then one must take into account there's an urbanized population that I think is tends to be less and less tribal. As people urbanize, you know, these these kings and stuff don't, don't really matter anymore. Um, that being said, uh, one thing that is underappreciated to me is that the borders of Africa was drawn by the European powers. And those borders have been made largely intact. And you take, for example, Botswana. The border of Botswana, you've got the Swana population staying off in South Africa, one foot in, uh, in, in South Africa, right? So how does, uh, what, what does that mean for the development of the two countries? It means if there is a cultural um, continuity, the one will have to develop with the other, alongside the other one, for example. I don't think the Singapore model will necessarily work in all of African countries, although Rwanda's leader, Paul Gagami, he is very much uh, calls himself an apostle of, of, of Lee Kuan Yew. Um, he's had lots of success implementing it, but it has to be said that he won the election of 93% of the vote. You know, so how that I, I don't think Lee Kuan Yew have gone even that far in his authoritarian methods. So um, you, you know, this is this is this is the, the, the way the, where the devil's in the detail. Becky, yeah. Yeah, so one of the most fundamental uh, institutions that really drive, drive growth uh, in Africa, South Africa, as well as other countries around the world is essentially how easy is it, it is to essentially start a business, how easy it, it is to employ someone. Uh, and unfortunately, in certain African countries, uh, there's an index that you can look at, uh, which is called the ease of doing business. Certain countries uh, rank below um, what is considered to be the uh, standard, essentially. Um, and it's something that I've seen also in South Africa, really, we, is that we have um, labor policy, which makes it expensive to hire someone and also often acts as a barrier to hire someone, such as that of minimum wages, which acts as a barrier to hire the low-skilled individual and prevents that person from upskilling themselves, as well as um, red tape to start a business and so forth, such as licensing, massive amounts of licensing that prevents certain businesses to essentially start uh, uh, operating. And this is a trend as well that we see in other African countries as well, because they have that authoritarian drive as well. Um, so in order for Africa to grow, in order for Africa to reach that point that we see in other countries, uh, other countries in Europe, as well as the US, we need to start, we need to, start to uh, bring down those barriers.
and it is are part of those barriers um, uh, based on on corruption within local political uh, local political systems. Yes, so that's actually a good point, really. Uh, so part of the problem is that part of the problem is the thinking of a government, a government that runs that country. An example that I can use is my country, South Africa. Uh, I mean, here the often question that's asked in the mainstream is why is the ANC not implementing those policies? Because South Africa has implemented those policies before in the early years of democracy. We've implemented policies that allowed the country to grow at substantial levels, increase the standard of living for people. Uh, I mean, the early successes of the ruling government we have uh, is one of employment. We doubled our employment rate, uh, access to water and electricity increased by levels of 200%. Uh, which is data that we have closely look at. So there was a general increase in the living standards of people in this country. But then in the years of Jacob Zuma and now Sir Ramaphosa, the thinking of the ruling government has sort of changed. It has changed to be more centralized, which uh, leaves the environment to be more ripe towards corruption. So that does play a, a uh, that does play a part in as to why it uh, as to why we don't see those reforms coming in that might help South Africa, uh, like. Um, We've also did some uh, research regarding looking at which members of parliament are implicit in corruption. And that answers the reason as to why we don't see any serious charges being alleged against uh, corrupt members of parliament. <laughs> and it's quite staggering. Uh, we'd say that if there was reform in prosecutions, if the government actually imposed uh, uh, prosecutions against corrupt officials, we'd see 40%, perhaps even more than 50% of members of parliament in the current ruling government going to jail. And that's exactly why they don't want those reforms happening, because they benefit significantly off the downfall of the country. You know, what, what I'm wondering about is, given this kind of experience, um, you know, in, in history, when we've had, let's say, democratic regimes that become corrupt, and I, I don't know whether public approval among the people in South Africa and other African countries towards their governments has gotten worse, doesn't this really open the door to a more authoritarian system? I mean, I'm thinking I'm, I'm the Chinese ambassador to, um, to South Africa, and I'm saying, what are you doing with these elections and, these, uh, and, a, and a free press? You know, look at our method. We've done so much better. I, is that kind of thinking beginning to take hold um, in more and more of Africa? Um, because I think the Chinese, particularly after COVID, are making a very strong case that the development model for countries like South Africa and all Africa and all developing countries, even, um, even uh, in South America, should be based on a Chinese model because the democratic model has failed. Yeah, I'm, uh, that's something I'm, I'm a bit concerned about. But I must say, so far, China's engagement in Africa, look, Ch China, I believe, is Africa's biggest training partner at the moment, followed by Germany, by the way, which is also underappreciated. So the Germans will make their own case, the Chinese make their own case. But generally, the Chinese interest in Africa, um, as far as I can tell, and I'm, I'm by no means an expert on it, um, it comes with a variety of interests. Some people are there just for pure business and making money, for example. In some countries, they build the, the, they build the infrastructure for the African countries. And in, in, tra in trade, they would like a little bit of, of resources for themselves. We've seen in Zambia, for example, uh, where the Chinese, um, or these allegations of them trying to capture the electrical supply of a country. Now, that's a critical infrastructure, right? But that being said, the, 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 maybe the Chinese are better at managing it seeing it than the, the Zambian government can be. Um, so it's, it's very difficult for me to judge what China wants in Africa. The question rather would be, what are the African leaders thinking themselves? Because they're traveling around the world, they, they're looking at all these places and they're saying, wow, look at what's happening in Asia. Maybe we need to bring some of those lessons home, right? And the question is, what type of lessons are they bringing home? If the lessons is open the market, ease business, etc. I mean, I would sign up for that any day. If the lessons is um, totalitarian control and have cameras on every street corner and watch the people's every move and, and, and watch the opposition and be turned into a, a society ran by the Jesuits, then uh, I'm not very, very optimistic about it. Um, in terms of South Africa in particular, now our leadership has at times flirted with authoritarianism. They have had at times tried to attack the free press, for example. They wanted a, a commission on um, 
forgot the right name now, my on media on, on the media, for example. And they wanted at one stage, one of the uh, members of the ANC, for example, proposed that there is uh, basically an elite group that has to decide what news you can have. During this pandemic, for example, they tried to pass a law which said any news, you, anything contrary to the government narrative of COVID-19 can be considered to be fake news, which is horrifying, right? But then South Africa um, has in particular a very strong civil culture that is has a very uh, deep memory of what happened during the apartheid years when there was censorship all over the country. And generally you've got a, a pushback from civil society. And that, that, that has always been a countervailing force in Africa. And um, one thing I think that's been unappreciated is how strong civil society spoke out against the apartheid regime, in particular the churches. And, you know, churches and politics shouldn't mix, but every now and then, um, you know, somebody like Desmond Tutu, for example, would raise his hand and say, listen, I don't agree with what the ruling party is doing. And they are very scared uh, when, when those type of people speak out. Yeah, so what I also find particularly interesting in South Africa's case is that we have an opposition party, well, opposition party called the Economic Freedom Party is not truly an opposition party. We don't think of them as an opposition party. They're mostly likely the youth version of the ANC, uh, somewhat more outspoken, somewhat, somewhat more radical. Now, South Africa has an, an employment rate of roughly 40, of roughly close to 40% of, uh, of the population. Uh, that's the people that are between the ages of 16 and 64, the people that are available to work, that figures roughly 48% of the employment rate. When you compare this to emerging markets, those averages around 60% and towards 70%. Now, what I find interesting here is that you have a country in which you have massive amounts of unemployment, yet the opposition party is currently sitting at levels at 10%. So I do sense that the, the massive... Um, uh, uh, barriers to economic growth, the massive decline in economic performance does create an environment for, uh, uh, for authoritarianism, populism, but to the extent, but I don't truly see that in South Africa, and I would look, mostly look at the EFF to give me that indication, and their levels are roughly, roughly flat, and this tells me about the, the sentiment of the average South African. When you ask them what do they want, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is a job and income so that they can provide for their families. Uh, and that's particularly quite telling. And even though we might see in universities that there is a sentiment, a favorable sentiment towards authoritarian um, uh, thinking, once they get a job, once they have responsibilities in life, those thoughts seem to fade away. Um, so I think what's currently happening in the case of South Africa is that the youth and a large proportion of South Africans, because we have a large proportion of South Africans that do not vote, are currently waiting for a better party to essentially offer something, so offer them something than what they offer something that's better than what the current administration is offering them. As you look at the um, at, you look at that point that you just raised about the importance of employment and how that changes people's attitudes for South Africa in particular, but maybe you could comment about other areas of Africa as well. What industries do you think will be able to uh, create the job base and the employment base that will be able to employ, you know, you're talking about 40 million, you're, you're talking about 40% of the world's population. Um, what's going to be able to employ all of these people? So it would largely be the small businesses. Um, that's why I emphasize quite um, extensively on making it sure, making sure that you re you remove all barriers um, for businesses to operate. Largely, the employments will come from small to medium sized businesses. That's where you're going to see a lot of people being employed compared to the bigger corporations. Uh, so it should the thinking of African leaders should be to ease the ease of doing business, to remove red tape. In other words, making it easier for these businesses to register, to register and to operate essentially. So low capital, low capital requirements. Yes, low capital requirements. Essentially. And so that it typically is retail, trade, um, professional services in, in the more uh, sophisticated areas. Um, any other kinds of things that are unique to Africa that we would look, look at as a potential driver? Uh, one that I would like to add is um, hunting. Um, you know, is, is 
they, they, I know there's a big debate in Europe and North America against hunting and, and there's a bit of tree huggers in, in those societies. But, um, you know, sometimes uh, when I speak to these game farmers, they tell me trophy hunting, for example, people coming from abroad provides an income for the, for, for the, for the community around them. Right. And it is used in conservation. And there's a big tourism industry, for example, attached to that. That's the one idea that comes to mind. In terms of heavy industry, um, look, we, we have seen trends that Chinese factories are leaving China for Africa. Um, they're not going to South Africa, unfortunately, they're going to Eastern African countries and they're moving their factories abroad. Okay. So because of cheaper labor costs, essentially. Now, I'm, I'm not convinced that Africa can necessarily. Um, go the Chinese route in the industry, mainly because automation has come in the last 30 years. And now the question is, how many people can even say to be employed in a factory? And we also see they need to be more skilled. You know, factory workers is no longer production line workers. It actually requires an engineer that is qualified to do it. And Africa often doesn't have those skills. So it, it is a big challenge. Um, I'm also still a believer in a, in a bit of a new deal. I wouldn't say to go excessive with it, but a little bit of a heavy infrastructure pre project. As a structural engineer, means I will have employment at least but it also means that um we, i mean for, for engine, structural engineering the industry is essentially the same as the 1960s and 70s highways are still built of bitumen and asphalt um we still use steel and concrete and we're still going to use them the next 200 years i'm convinced um you know there, there's some things that i don't see a robot can do necessarily and you know perhaps they might be a, a bit of a ladder up i'm also particularly worried about auto self-driving cars and automation and things of these sorts how is that going to affect the african economy because that tends to be a leg up for many people south africa also have a very um uh, i would say a, a, a very um a, as a taxi industry that protests a lot and uh, we we have seen that uber drivers unfortunately they, they didn't protest as in the us they actually attacked them and they burned their cars right yeah. so uber has been chased out of the country in some instances but you know I, what I'm wondering though is um, if I mean are we going to be looking in Africa for a new path because you know I I had the um, good fortune I suppose to study both and to work in both China and Japan and I visited Korea and I was a consultant to the Singapore government so I sort of cover a lot of those bases and they had a particular path, which was, you know, let's say like in Singapore, where I was most intimately involved, you start off with textiles and then you went to electronics and now you're in biotech and now you're in artificial intelligence. And, you know, we've dealt with companies on, uh, on the vaccine front that are partnerships um, that, that are partially uh, between San Diego uh, company and the, uh, uh, and, and, and Singapore investors and Singapore researchers. And then, so there was this move up, which I think, you know, as Hugo points out, automation may make that path harder. I mean, one of the great things that made the Korean, Taiwanese, Chinese, Japanese miracle was mass employment in industrial facilities. Now, remember this took place before the green movement so they didn't have that constraint. I mean, we now have a situation, for instance, where as I understand it, I think Hugo, you may have mentioned this to my class where, you know, you can't even, uh, the, the, you, the international organizations won't even do a, a loan for a gas or a coal plant for electricity. So is Africa uh, going to be able to come up with its own development model with maybe different values and different approaches because I don't think the Asian model can be applied um, given the historical circumstances. I would say, I guess it depends on the time horizon. In the short term, I don't particularly see that happening. However, in the long term, I do think that there is opportunity in Africa as well. Uh, just the point that you raised as well in the automation, I think we need to also look at what sort of incentivizes businesses to be more auto uh, driven essentially and I think that is the barrier to employ someone uh, the restrictions uh, uh, that that make it more expensive to employ that particular individual and uh, as, so long as we work around so long as those restrictions are removed then I think we might see that employment in those particular industries 
And I think even if we see some level of automation, I think we'll see jobs shift for more labor intensive industries to more automated industries such as technology, digital finance and whatnot. So I think it also, I think in the long term, we could see that happening at play. You know, one of the worries that I've got is, and I don't know, I'd like to know whether this is shared in, um, in South Africa, but I'm worried that a history of colonialism in Africa from Western Europe is just going to be replaced by a new history of colonialism from China. If you look at the Belt and Road program um, and you look at the issues that are driving China, right? 10 of, 10 of the most or eight of the 10 most polluted places on the planet are in Chinese cities. There's going to be an obvious desire to export their pollution to someplace else, right? And I'm just wondering whether or not it's China that's looking at um, the future of Africa as its colony in a sense, to, you know, leaving aside the political aspects of that and whether or not that, that concerns people in Africa. We, we've seen some of that. So I'll give you one statistic. Namibia used to be colonized by the Germans, used to be called German Southwest Africa. And today you find that the Chinese minority in Namibia is larger than the German minority. Okay, so the Chinese have already replaced it. But that being said, Namibia has only got a million people. Okay, In Botswana, um, the Chinese came in. They wanted to build railways at one stage. And the Botswana president chased them away because they didn't want to employ local uh, um, Botswana people, for example. I've worked in infrastructure projects in Lesotho, where the entire thing from beginning to end is done by Chinese labor. And uh, they employ very few local po lo of the local population. That walk regrets creates a resentment. Um, they has been, even during this pandemic, a growing skepticism towards China and Africa. But now, obviously, um, we must understand that there's been Chinese in South Africa, for example, for um, was it almost 150 years, I believe. I mean, they are local South African. By all means, they speak English and some even speak a bit of Afrikaans. Um, so the question is, what do you do about those people, for example? They, 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 you need to protect them in, 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 the same, in the same dialogue. So... I would say with colonialism, well, my, I've always taken a view that you either live in an empire or you are the empire. Mm. And, and, and that being said, you know, we, we sort of live in the U.S. empire at this stage. You know, we're speaking English for a reason over here. Um, and the, the advantage that China gave Africa has been that they could be the middlemen, for example, between the Chinese and the West. Right. And as long as that relationship continues, not in an antagonistic way, but to say to the Chinese, listen, America's giving me A, what can you give me, mm. for example? If we, if we can negotiate on that footing, I think it will be beneficial. If it's going to be a loot of resources, like it used to be during the European powers, particularly in the DRC, in the, in the Congo, I mean, uh, it's going to be a repeat of history. But the Chinese does come to Africa with infrastructure. And this is something that is the, the West doesn't appreciate. The West works through the, um, uh, the World Bank and the IMF, and essentially they give loans. And the question always in many Africans' mind is, aren't you just taking money from poor people in rich countries and giving it to rich people in poor countries? Um, the Chinese come and say, we'll build you a highway and a road, but we want a little bit of the, um, of the resources ourselves. So it's a, it's a negotiation settlement. Problem in the beginning has been very few African leaders were very good at uh, negotiation, but I think they've learned a little bit. Um, so you take, for example, the uh, people in Angola are very good at playing the Chinese off against the Americans. Um, in uh, Ethiopia, the Chinese are building some of the infrastructure there. And that's benefiting, of course, the local Ethiopian population. So if China comes with that model, and that is better than the Western loan model, for example, um, you know, the, the people in, in Africa are going to choose China over it. I'm in particularly worried what Joel mentioned about the IMF and the World Bank um, stopping loans to um, CO2 based projects in Africa. Essentially, they don't want to find coal or gas. Well, the Chinese are coming. They say, we're going to build you a coal plant or a gas plant. Right. And the reality is that Africa's carbon emissions is a fraction of the world's total carbon emissions. And speaking about this population to the end of the century, I don't see any way how Africa can develop by the end of the century without increasing its carbon footprint. And to some extent, that can also, limitation on carbon footprint can also be seen as a new colonial policy. So uh, the question is, uh, are the Americans on the, on the right argument here? Yeah, so that's an, actually an interesting point that Hugo raised there between China and, and the West. And I think what something that what we I'm particularly looking at really is countries in Africa that are essentially running out of money, uh, government money, essentially. Um, 
Uh, if we look at budget deficits, especially here in the country, we've reached budget deficits only reached four times within South Africa's history. First in the First World War, second in the Second World War, third during the end of our budget date, and now this is the fourth time. So we're reaching the stage in which South Africa is essentially running out of money. It is out of money. And the South African government is unwilling to go to the West because it uh, the loan uh, uh, comes, the loan from the West, from such institutions such as the IMF, come with conditions. And they are very reluctant of giving sovereignty to uh, the IMF, such as deciding on which policy the ANC should follow. So I think that could provide an incentive to go to China. But China hasn't really come and offered South Africa any money, although they do offer certain countries money, such as what uh, in infrastructure, uh, such as what uh, Hugo mentioned before. I think what's particularly dangerous, uh, what's particularly dangerous right now, is that countries will now move from borrowing money from country, from uh, from China or the IMF, and now start to consider to print money. Uh, there's a growing interest within South Africa as well as other countries in Africa of modern monetary theory. That is the thinking that a country can never essentially go bankrupt if it if it prints money in its in its own currency, which this is a dangerous way of thinking about things. Sounds uh, vaguely by my republic to me. Probably, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So this is a dangerous thing that we, we see uh, taking hold in certain African countries, even in certain Western countries as well. Yeah, what, what is the exchange rate right now in Zimbabwe? <laughs> Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> Something like a couple of million Zimbabwean dollars yeah. for the, to the... Uh, I, I had a Zim dollar where they ran out of zeros. They had to write it on the back you know, <laughs> because of inflation. So, you know, obviously, you know, uh, you know just sort of wrapping things up, I, I just, I mean, the world needs some other model. You know, the Western model has certainly been this, somewhat discredited and and um, if nothing else, the Westerners don't seem to believe in it either anymore, or at least the uh, large parts of the ruling class don't seem to believe in it, not to mention academia and the media. And, you know, the Chinese model is a, you know, I think scary. Um, I mean, particularly, I think if you're, you have any, you know, as I know is very powerful in Africa, you have a very powerful religious uh, movements in Africa. Um, actually, many of uh, 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 many of the people, I, when we've been working on religion after COVID, many of the preachers who are doing best are in Africa, you know, both um, Islamic and, um, and Christian. So what, what I'm wondering is, can we foresee a time in which Africa actually comes up with, the, with a future model? Because if the Western model has its problems and the Chinese model has its problems, what is possible coming from Africa that could perhaps shape the, the world of the 21st century. You know, the world certainly needs the help. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I still think that Westerners don't know their own history. I mean, and, and, and this has been one, I mean, I'm astonished sometimes that I've met Americans that have never read their own constitution, for example. Um, and you find, I mean, I, I still like a lot about the Western model. I mean, of course, it has to be reformed for Africa and it has to go through own African values. But I mean, the, the, the model of having at least democracy and an open debate. I mean, we have a bit of a democracy in South Africa. We have a democracy in South Africa. We have a democracy in Ghana, for example, that's very stable. Botswana has had one since independence. And Botswana is actually a remarkable model for development. I wish more African leaders would look at Botswana and not regard it as a Western puppet state, for example. Um, so th there is some... Hugo, just, just to help us a little bit, what has Botswana done that you think has been so successful? Well, they, when Botswana got independence, it did not align itself, first of all, with the Soviet Union. Because remember, during the Cold War, there was, you go either east or you go west. Botswana rather stood towards a free market economy, a um, rule of law. Rule of law is very widely enforced in Botswana. And by rule of law, I mean divisions of power. So I always make the point that a country cannot guarantee any rights if power isn't sufficiently divided first. So uh, Botswana has a separation between the judicial, the executive, um, and the parliament, and what's it, legislative, for example. And th that is respected throughout the country. Um, if you have those things, it can work. And then Botswana focused on trade. I mean, it, it's, it's a no-brainer for many countries that you need infrastructure, highways in and out of the country to get the goods and services in and out of it, and then business and trade. And generally, the government can provide the infrastructure, but they cannot tell the businesses how to trade. 
And, and that's more or less the model that Botswana looked at. Um, also, Botswana did not um, chase away the white population that, um, first of all, came as missionaries to um, bring Christianity and later get, provide the education. They actually embraced the Christian you know, ethos and model. And they mixed it up, of course, with their traditional beliefs as well. So I think a model such as that for Botswana um, is quite remarkable. And there's an interesting statistic that uh, somebody in the Free Market Foundations of Africa always quotes. If you take the country that's grown the fastest in the last 60 years, it is not China, it's Botswana. Mm. But it's underappreciated. Um, so I think if African leaders could just look at what they've got already, they don't need to go shopping around the world for other ideas. That's great. Yeah, I 100% agree with Hugo there. I mean, there are certain good ideas that come from the West that essentially also would help uh, Africa, uh, such as rule of law, uh, freedom of speech, as well as property property rights as well, uh, which essentially um, it, which essentially prevents the state from taking over what you've hard on worked. That would allow investment in certain African countries. Uh, unfortunately, we have certain governments in, in Africa that are weakening those institutions as well as here in South Africa as well. That's why we're seeing a lack of investment in these countries. So as long as you strengthen those simple uh, institutions, I think that's when you'd see massive investments in Africa. And there are countries in Africa, such as Hugo mentioned, Botswana, as well as Rwanda, uh, that, that are strengthening those institutions such as property rights, rule of law, and the small government. Well, it's great to see that there's, there's hope, that there are models that seem to be working, uh, and that, uh, you know, the, the history has not yet been written on Africa. It's going to be fascinating to see how it all evolves. Thank you so much, Beheki and, and uh, Hugo, for joining us. Uh, this is a fascinating, fascinating conversation. And, 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 and very important for our listeners, because as you well know, uh, the West, Western media does not cover Africa very much and only when there's a, some sort of disaster. And we don't know about what's happened with Botswana or what's happening in, uh, I happen to have a friend who works in Ghana, so I've heard something about it, but you know, uh, we need to understand better what's going on in Africa because it's gonna be the pivot of the 21st century. And the more we can learn about it and we, it's the better, and we are very much um, appreciative of learning from both of you. Oh, thank you too. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for having us on.